Secrets of Success. A four-part video series with Dr. Robert A. Cook. In this program, Dr. Cook discusses how to modify character, or will I ever be any different? Here's Dr. Cook. Well, hello, friends. This is your good friend, Dr. Cook, and I'm going to spend some time with you around the Word of God. In this program, we're talking about how to modify character. Have you ever looked in the mirror and said, my Lord, will I ever be any different? You thought about your failures and your hang-ups and some habits that you've formed through the years, and you thought, oh boy, I don't suppose I'll ever be any different. I know all of you married ladies have long since given up trying to train your husband to hang up his clothes. He still drapes them on the floor, doesn't he? <laughs> and you try to train him to clean off the sink after he's shaved, but he still leaves that little ring of whiskers around the edge of the sink, doesn't he? Ah, people don't change. As a matter of fact, we all get a little bit more obvious as we get older. And sometimes that's good. They say after 50, a person gets the face he deserves. <laughs> well, we'll let that one be. But uh, the point is, the Bible says you can be different. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And God can make a person different. Now, he won't give you a new set of teeth, or he won't grow any new hair. Uh, I never saw anything like that happen in uh, the process of regeneration of the soul. But he will give you a changed attitude based on a changed personality. Now, that's what we're going to be talking about in this program. And we're looking at the 119th Psalm. There's a whole set of wonderful truths in the 119th Psalm, every one of which bears upon a human nature problem. Uh, this one here, will I ever be any different? How to modify my character. Another one, how to uh, combat inertia, how to get going in life. Another one, how to master uh, discouragement. Another one, how to live with criticism and like it. I tell you, that's a good one. I can't wait to get to that one. <laughs> but uh, here we are in this matter of uh, trying to be different. Where do you start? Look at Psalm 119, verse 9. If you have your Bible, you want to look, uh, follow along. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto, says the psalmist, according to thy word. You have to want to be different. Walter Kallenbach, the blind evangelist, used to say so often, if you don't want to be different, nobody can help you. But if you do want to be different, Jesus can help you. And so it is with uh, our consideration here. Do you want to be any different? Or, or do you enjoy being just what you are? Henry Brandt, my good friend of many years, was dealing with a client, I suppose 30 or 40 years ago now, as he tells the story. The young man uh, came in with some very real symptoms. You know, never, never uh, cut down a person because he has symptoms that are based upon his feelings, because they're real, I'll tell you. And this young man had some real problems. But as he told his story, it developed that he really hated his father-in-law. I mean, he hated him <laughs> with a purple passion. And so what was Henry going to do? Well, he said, after the young man told his story, he said, now, you've got some very real problems. If I were able to give you a prescription that would uh, relieve you of these symptoms and at the same time give you real love for your father-in-law, would you be interested? And the young man thought a moment, Henry said, and then got up from the desk where he was seated and turned toward the door. And as he went out the door, he said, no, nope, I'd rather go on hating him. And he went on out. Now, uh, Maybe you are that way, and if you are, you may as well just give up because there isn't any help for you if you want to stay the way you are. But if you want to be different, you start with the Word of God. Get your Bible and find what God's Word, the inerrant, infallible, inspired Word of God has to say about your needs and your condition. You'll be amazed how specific God is. He does talk to us through his word. The word of God is quick. That means alive, alive and powerful 
and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God knows who you are and where you live, and he will talk with you in his word. So he says, taking heed thereto according to thy word. I'm a great believer in inventory, personality inventory, that is. Although in business you have to watch your inventory too, you know. You can lose your shirt if your inventory is off. But now we're talking about personality inventory. Uh, sit down just with you and God and think about what kind of a person you are. List your good points. We'll start there so you don't get upset. And then list some of your habits, good and bad, and list some of your points of failure where things seem to fall apart routinely. List the areas where you always fail. Each of us has what the Bible calls a besetting sin, where humanly you would always fail. And uh, then after you've made that inventory, then take the points that you're concerned about and bring them to your reading and study of the Word of God, taking heed thereto according to thy word. You have to want to be different, and you need to bring that desire, beloved friend, to the Word of God, prayerfully, honestly, seeking what God has to say to you about it. Then he says, with my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Seeking God with your whole heart. You have two concepts here, and they're very important. First of all, there's complete abandonment to God. Now, every one of us who has uh, walked with God for very long has come to a place where uh, we have had to say, God, I don't have to have it my way. I just, uh, I just want your will. Complete abandonment to God. Uh, I don't know whether you're willing to face that or not because it's awfully uncomfortable. There are certain things in my life that I wish God would just uh, stay away from and let me have my own way. It's like uh, Clyde Naramore's little girl said when she was just a little toddler. She was bent on doing something naughty, I guess, and he was trying, psychologist that he was, to talk her out of it. And he said, come up and sit on my knee and let's talk about this. So she got up and sat on his knee and put her little arm around his neck and said to him, Daddy, let's not talk about it. Let's just let me have my way. <laughs> she was learning early, wasn't she? Well, that's how we say to God oftentimes, Lord, have thine own way, but please let me have my way. Well, you can't have it both ways, can you? There has to be a willingness to abandon yourself completely to the will of God, no matter what. Have you come to that point? Now, I mean, zero in on the area of concern. You got a bad temper, a short fuse? Are you jealous? Uh, do you have difficulty forgiving uh, people who have hurt you deeply? Zero in on, on the areas of concern, dear friend, and then bring that area to God and say, Lord, I'm going to give this completely to you. No matter what you say, no matter how you tell me to, to act, no matter what your word directs me to do, no matter what it may cost me in time or action or whatever, I'm yours on this matter. And when you turn yourself over to God in faith on any given area, he takes charge. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Are you willing to face that? Complete abandonment. Passing, as they say in the flying business, passing the, the point of no return. You're flying across a body of water and you come to a place where you no longer have enough fuel to go back to the airfield from which you took off. You have to go on. Pass the point of no return with God. Complete abandonment of yourself to God. Then he says, oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. I took just enough flying instruction to, to be vaccinated with it. I've never gotten over it, although I never got my pilot's license. One of the great disappointments in my life, I guess, is that I never got a pilot's license. But I had some dual instruction with Paul Hartford, my uh, missionary friend years ago in his Beechcraft Bonanza. And oh, it was fascinating. We, we flew to Cuba, which was then open to the gospel, and to some of the other Caribbean islands, and I had a great time of fellowship with him. And meanwhile, he told me how to keep the, the craft uh, 
uh, flying straight and level and how to bank it and how to stall it and so on and so on. He got a little upset when I put it into a secondary stall. You pilots will understand. He, he grabbed the wheel and he said, I better take over. <laughs> Those wings in the Beechcraft are apt to fall off if you, if, you, uh, if you treat them too rough. So anyhow, there I am, flying. And I'm asking questions. Well, I noticed that after he took off, he twisted a little knob on the, on the compass. And I said, why do you do that? He said, you have to adjust this compass every so often to make sure that it is properly zeroed in. Well, I didn't know then and I don't know now what the mechanics of it is. I only know that constant adjustment is part of the business of keeping a ship or an airplane headed in the right direction. You have to adjust for wind drift. You have to adjust for other factors. Constant vigilance to make sure that you are on the right track, in other words. Now, I've oversimplified that, and you people who are experts will soon tell me so, but you know the point that I'm trying to make. He says, oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. I knew a man years ago who wouldn't even mail a letter on Sunday. He was so completely dedicated to the idea of serving the Lord absolutely on the Lord's day. I saw him years later, and he'd been successful in business, and in connection with his business, he sponsored a racing boat uh, for advertising purposes. Uh, you can understand how that would be, uh, but I saw that he went to the races on Sunday and someone whom I knew asked him, uh, why are you at, at the races? Oh, he said, I have to be. I have to be. It's business, you know. It's business. Well, now, I don't think there's anything uh, that's going to keep him out of heaven for having watched his racing boat that was sponsored by his company in its competition on Sunday. I wouldn't have done it, but then I'm not his judge. I simply am telling you that a man who wouldn't mail a letter or buy an ice cream cone on Sunday, years later, had drifted enough so that his conscience didn't bother him at all in doing something quite more significant on Sunday. It is possible to drift. Do you hate sin as much as you used to? Or do you put up with it more in your own life and in the lives of others? These are things that we have to grapple with. He says, oh, let me not wander. It is possible to drift. The writer to the Hebrew says, let us give the more diligent heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should drift away from them. You see, it's not a matter simply of, of making a, a big decision once, and that's everything, and it's, it's all over, and I'm on the way to heaven. What we have to remember is that life is a continuing process, beloved. And you and I have to make sure that we are not just drifting our way through life. You follow me? Let me not wander. Now, would you do, when you do that inventory that we're talking about, would you be honest with yourself and with God and uh, just face the fact that you may have been drifting a little here and there, a little more easygoing in matters of ethics or of morals or of finance? a little less easy to get along with at home, a little less courteous, a little less considerate, a little less loving. I was in the pastorate for 18 years, and during those years of meeting people three times a day, go tell somebody about the Lord Jesus, a thousand calls a year, you know that I met many people who had, as we say, blown it in life, and the, the recurring theme was, oh, if I had only taken the time to be loving, and to be thoughtful, and to be kind. Well, you can't unscramble an egg. You can't go back and do it over. But that's how it is. Are you drifting? Maybe you better think about that and let God straighten out the course of your life. And then he says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And that, of course, has to do with the action of the word of God in your unconscious mind. You have a computer between your two ears. You know that, I guess, don't you? Far more complex than anything that, that the manufacturers have ever put out. And that computer needs to be properly programmed. 
Thy word have I hid in my heart means, we can just put it a little different way, God's word is in the computer of my mind. They call it the unconscious mind. I suppose that was, <laughs> I suppose that was named for a college freshman. You know, they not only don't know anything, they don't suspect anything. Well, uh, be that as it may, there is a way to put the word of God into the computer so that the faithful indwelling Holy Spirit can crank it out when you need it. The most blessed realization I know is the realization that God is faithful to remind me of his word just when it's needed. How many times that has happened in my own life? Well, thy word have I hid in my heart. How do you do it? Number one, read it. Read and reread a passage of scripture until you are thoroughly familiar with it. Second, meditate upon it. That means chew it over, think about it, turn it over, ask what it means, relate it to other passages of Scripture, ask what the application of it ought to be in your life, meditate upon it. Third, memorize it. Go over a passage of Scripture, say it again and again with the reference. I find that helps me. If you say the reference before the verse and after the verse, you will find it sticking in your mind better. I don't know why that's so, I only know it is so. The navigators have uh, given that method to us low these many years. Fore and aft, they call it. Give the reference before you quote the verse and afterwards it does stick in your mind. Memorize it. And then make a conscious effort to let go of it. Because in so doing, you put it back into the computer. Uh, you can prove this for yourself. You've had a thought concerning which you said, I won't think about that. Now what happened? When you said that to yourself, you just ended up thinking about it more, didn't you? Well, uh, use that same principle positively concerning the Word of God. Put it in the computer. Read it until you're thoroughly familiar with it. Meditate on it, chew it over, think it over, turn it over, apply it uh, until it has become part of your own feeling process in your heart. And then memorize it and then make a conscious effort to let go of it. Oh, incidentally, this is part of the procedure in getting a new idea about anything. Did you know that? You can get a new idea about any given subject if you'll follow the same procedure. Get yourself some three by five cards and write out everything you can possibly think about that subject on separate three by five cards. And then rearrange those cards. I would say shuffle, but some of you were tenderly reared. So uh, rearrange those cards and you'll find that new ideas come out of the arrangement of ideas. Then think, and because you're a Christian, pray. Think and pray about all of those ideas on those cards until your mind is just weary of the process, and then try to forget it. Just chuck it out and try to forget it. That's the way to get a new idea. I thought maybe you'd like just a little extra. I'll throw that in free. A little extra idea on how to get some creative ideas in your own life. Yes, you can depend on the faithful Holy Spirit to crank out the uh, Word of God from your mind and memory, from the computer, as we say, when it's needed. How precious, how faithful is our blessed Lord. Now he said, blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. Adopt the position of a learner. I got a good rebuke a good many years ago in my own office when I was serving as president of the King's College. I was chewing out a young man. Well, I'm such a nice guy. You wouldn't think I'd ever chew anybody out, would you? But I was. I was giving, a, a, giving him what for about something. And, uh, and I said to him, you know, buddy, after all, you're here to learn. And he looked me right in the eye and he said, well, and so, good doctor, are you. <laughs> oh, he, he put me down there. But I had it coming. Now, the position of a learner, you never get beyond the need to learn from God and from people. You listen, learn to listen. Listen to what people tell you. You don't learn anything with your mouth open and shouting. You, you'll soon discover that. But we need also to, to learn from the Lord. Take my yoke upon you and learn, Jesus said, of me. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. 
God wants to teach you all the way. One of the delightful discoveries that you make as the years go by is that you needn't stop discovering wonderful things about our Lord and about yourself with the Lord. To know that God is still working with you is a great delight. And it can be yours, my dear friend, simply for the changing of your attitude. Adopt the position of the learner. Teach me, Lord. Now, what does God want to teach you? Well, take an illustration from, from real life. Here's a little three-year-old boy. And you are walking down the street with you. You come to an intersection. He wants to dash across the street. What do you do? You say, take my hand. Then you grab his. I don't know why we grown-ups do that. We say, take my hand. Then we, we grab hold of the youngster and hang on. But uh, you're, you're holding on to him. And you look down at him and say, wait for the light. Don't you want to grow up and have troubles? Well, uh, he has to wait because you got hold of him. Now 10 years go by. He's now 13. You come to the same uh, intersection. Do you have to hold his hand? No, he wouldn't have you holding his hand. Especially if you're an, an aunt or a grandma or something. He's a, he's a man now. He's a teenager. But do you have to tell him, wait for the light? No. Why? Because he's learned that that's how things work. Learning is the process of discovering how things work. Now, that's an oversimplified cookism, I admit. But it'll fit here. Because as you walk with your Lord and look into his word, what he wants to tell you is just to let you discover how things work in the will of God. Would you bear that in mind? Teach me. Adopt the position of the learner. Then he says, With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. Now, what difference does it make what you say about the Lord? Well, friend, all I know is this. What you learn from God's word and what you put into the computer of your mind and heart is reinforced when you share it with someone else. Many years ago, I asked Stephen Alford, who many of you know, great expositor of the Word of God, pastor for many years and conference speaker. Uh, he was over from Great Britain on his first trip in the States. And I was president of Youth for Christ, and we were booking him around here and there. Dear man of God, we got to be good friends immediately. One day I said to him, well, how, brother, do you really feed on the word? How do you refresh your own soul? And he told me, well, he said, I have a very simple program. He said, stay with any given passage of the word of God until it says something to you. And he said, now that's not making sermon outlines. It is, it is simply waiting on God until he says something to your own heart. Then second, he says, write that down. Because if you can't write it, you haven't got it. Get a little blank book of some sort and write it down. Then third, he said, pray it back to God until uh, it, your own heart is warm and tender with the truth that God has given you. And then fourth, and this is the point that we're talking about now. Fourth, said he, share it with somebody else as soon as you can that day. Well, I followed that good advice for a good many years, more than 40 now, I guess. And it has served me well, and I pass it on to you. Stay with a passage of Scripture until it says something to you. Write it down, pray it back, and then share it with someone else as soon as you can that very day. It has a repercussive effect. Any of you fellows shoot uh, uh, trap or skeet with your shotguns? Well, you know when you pull the trigger on your 12-gauge, it has what we call a kick. <laughs> well, that means that there's a repercussion. And the same thing is true with the Word of God when you share it with someone else. The impact that is made upon your own life is very, very real. Will I ever be any different? Yes, you can be. Do you want to be? Go to the Word of God. Are you willing to, to abandon yourself to God? and to adopt a position of constant adjustment to his will? Are you willing to put the word of God in your own computer so that the Holy Spirit who indwells the believer can bring it out to your mind and consciousness just when it's needed? Are you willing to adopt the 
position of the learner and let God teach you day by day? And are you willing to share what God has to say to you? Now, there's one other thing here. If you want to be different, he says, I have to learn to enjoy God's word and God's will. Verses 14 and 16. He said, I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. To rejoice in the word of God, to delight in the word of God. What does that mean? Well, many people have told me, he said, Brother Bob, uh, I fall asleep over the Bible. I, it's boring. Well, now, what do you do about that? Number one, you have to learn to get acquainted with the author. This lady got a novel for a Christmas present, later decided, gathered dust. Midway through the year, she went to some reception or other and was introduced to a young man whom she asked, what do you do? And he said, I'm an author. Perhaps you've seen my latest book. And he named the novel that she had been given as a Christmas present. She went back and sat up all night reading the book because she had met the author. I think we have to learn to spend some time with the Lord before we're going to enjoy his word. I find that my feelings vary. I don't always feel holy. Do you? You wake up shouting hallelujah? <laughs> well, that, of course, is an occupational hazard. Your wife may complain about it if you're disturbing her rest, her beauty nap. But uh, there's a verse for that, incidentally. He that riseth early in the morning and blesseth his neighbor with a loud voice, behold, it shall be counted a curse unto him. So pipe down in the morning. No, you don't always feel holy in the morning. But I find this, when I get the word of God and I open it up and I get down on my knees and I talk to the author, something happens in the way I feel about the Bible. Now, I can't tell you how that is. I only know that it works. To delight yourself in God's word will make you a different kind of person. Will you remember that? To delight yourself in God's word will make you a different kind of person. Well, we've come a long way on this program, and I trust that there have been some things that have been of value to your own heart and life. Let me have some prayer with you. Holy Father, we pray that thou wouldst make thy word applicable to our lives, alive in its effect on our conduct. May Jesus get all the glory. We ask in his name, amen. Well, I go off the air always with a greeting. Walk with the King today and be a blessing. This program was recorded in the studios of Christian Productions. For more information, write Dr. Robert A. Cook, P.O. Box 251, Tannersville, Pennsylvania, 18372. Dr. Cook's programs are produced and distributed by Christian Duplications International, 1710 Lee Road, Orlando, Florida, 32810. Call toll-free 1-800-327-9332. In Florida, call 1-800-432-5309.